Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're talking about the difficult clinical and ethical decision-making during the pandemic. I'm joined today by Dr. Christy Rentmeester, a PhD and director and managing editor of the AMA Journal of Ethics in Chicago. Dr. Helen Chappell, a PhD and professor of ethics educator affiliated with the College of Nursing at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. And Dr. Sarah Nelson, a physician and assistant professor of neurosurgery and neurology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Uh, although thankfully, we're starting to see some relief the past couple of months have forced many hospitals to implement implement crisis standards of care. Dr. Rentmeester, can we talk about how crisis standards uh, of care differ from normal standards of care and how they affect ethic ethical decision-making during the pandemic? Sure. So placing the word crisis and the word standard next to each other deserves a little bit of unpacking. So in healthcare, crisis means triage, and triage means that standards have to change to meet the conditions that are not normal. So under crisis conditions, it's impossible to deliver clinically indicated care to every patient whose symptoms warrant that care. The cold hard fact is that not everyone gets what they deserve normally. And that's hard to accept, but it is just part of the ethical meaning of crisis and triage. So then which strategies do we have to responding equitably to these crises? So since crisis conditions demand shifts in our decision making, Perhaps the most responsible thing that we can do is to be transparent about which values we're using to guide our decisions about how we alter the standards of care under crisis conditions. So when the normal links between indications and interventions get disrupted, we have to make sure that we distribute the risks and benefits of that disruption equitably. So I'm not saying that equity is easy or comfortable, but it's what's required to manage a crisis justly. Dr. Chappell, you know, talk about those ethical issues that are at play in hospitals during the pandemic. Well, I'd be happy to do that. There's so many. <laughs> it's hard to, uh, hard to just zero in on one. Um, it's interesting that um, in the work that I've been doing, I've been finding out that the visitor policies are big problems uh, that um, nurses and physicians really want visitors, that patients do better when they have visitors. Uh, there aren't really numbers to show us that not having visitors is uh, definitely better for people. Uh, so that's a problem that I'm hearing from people all over the country, basically, that visitor policies are a problem and that uh, Patients do better and people do better if they can see one another. It's funny that I, I never really thought of that as an ethical issue, but it is related to the outcome is what you're saying. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, and there, then there are the sort of obvious things that you might guess, that if you've been able to stay healthy and your family's been able to stay healthy, which may be big assumptions under these conditions, uh, that the nurse-patient ratios are stretched and that caring for patients you're not used to caring for because people are moving all over the hospital. Uh, nurses are not having time off to sort of process what's going on. They go home, they sleep, they come back. Uh, so they are not able to reflect and process on the fact that they are having these kinds of problems. Maybe they're in a, in a unit where they're seeing people die far more frequently than they're used to. Uh, so uh, they're, they're having trouble when they have to tell families that they don't have time to FaceTime with them can be a problem. Uh, yet I am still hearing that nurses are really trying to be sure that patients are not dying alone, even as stretched as they are, that they are working hard to be in that room and holding that patient's hand as they die. It's interesting. You, you do bring up the, you know, the topic of shortages. I, I think during the, you know, especially at the beginning of this, we talked a lot about shortages of equipment and shortages of PPE, but the, the staff shortages and the team shortages, you know, become a particular problem. Uh, Dr. Nelson, you know, can you talk about personnel shortages and how that influences resource, resource allocation, you know, both for patients with good and bad prognoses? 
Yeah, no, um, it's a it's a great uh, question and um, one that I know a lot of intensivists have had to deal with in the last uh, year. I guess now that we're up upon a year already. Um, you know, at, at the beginning, as you're right, uh, you know, PPE was a big deal. Ventilators were a big deal. Uh, are we going to have to, you know, triage some patients to um, getting these resources over others, which is like a huge ethical dilemma and one that I know caused a lot of psychological trauma uh, globally. Uh, you know, we kind of started hearing it first from Italy, but then other places as well. But but now, as uh, you know, um, uh, as Dr. Travel was mentioning as well, uh, you know, personnel, uh, you know, getting burnout at this stage of the game. It's been a long, uh, tough year uh, for physicians, and I think more especially nurses. And, um, you know, because they're so close to the patient, uh, you know, caring for, for patients, um, and, and also respiratory therapists as well, uh, given their proximity to the patient as well. They're both nurses and respiratory therapists in such high-risk categories, and both of them are uh, extremely needed in a uh, a pandemic and one that is uh, so focused on, you know, affecting the respiratory system in particular. And so um, I think we have seen over the over the past year um, and even in the ICU in which I currently work in as well, some shortages, particularly in the nursing department. How, how do you see that, you know, affecting the paradigm of team based care? What what changes have had to be made? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that there's anything super specific. I would say that, you know, morale and certainly the psychological effects have been uh, a big uh, change that we have seen. Uh, a lot of people um, just not with the, you know, uh, go and get them type attitude that normally one, you know, went into medicine or nursing in the first place to kind of take care of patients and know that they're providing the best care they can. The fact that they, uh, you know, um, nursing ratios, nursing to patient ratios have had to um, change for the worse, I think has really um, made the dynamic uh, worse in a sense. And, um, you know, having worked with uh, and continuing to work with, uh, you know, nurses on, on a frequent uh, basis here in an ICU type setting, it's, uh, you know, the strain is uh, unfortunately um, apparent. And, um, you know, I, typically uh, I've seen nursing care in an ICU setting, it's usually best on a two to one ratio, two patients to one nurse. And even in our ICU, sometimes it has to go to three to one. And, um, and that's, not, uh, that's not ideal uh, either. Well, Dr. Chapo, yeah. We often talk about how the pandemic has really stressed a system that's already been flawed. But uh, so we've heard, you know, about uh, a lot about physician wellness in this particular paradigm. But one one thing that I want to ask you about is this idea of moral distress, and you know how that has been plaguing hospital staff, and how that's different right now than in other times. Well, moral, moral distress is, is the idea that you see something that you want to change that you think needs to be different, but there are powers beyond your influence that keep you from making those changes. And so in any normal times, nurses are caught uh, with situations that they can't change and that they feel morally distressed about. It's part of the territory, but it's highly magnified in this situation because, as I said, if you're working flat out uh, for the entire shift and then you go home and sleep, you can't reflect on what has gone on and what you, you are worried about in terms of not being able to meet the standards, speaking of standards, that you're used to meeting uh, or you haven't been able to meet with families in the way that you want to, uh, then it is exactly true that you're going to be burning out. In fact, the New York Times has an article today that says that clinicians are leaving the field because they can't take it anymore. Uh, there is just so much stress and moral distress going on for them. That uh, I saw that article, and uh, it is shocking. There's so many uh, you know, underlying conditions that make physician burnout. Uh, already a huge problem uh, before the pandemic. And now, you know, what you hear from physicians oh, and the healthcare teams over and over again, I've never seen this many people die. So can you talk about uh, resource allocation, you know, 
and considerations that come with that kind of volume of dying patients uh, during crises like this. Uh, uh, Dr. Nelson? Yeah, so, um, you know, resource allocation, um, you know, as we were talking earlier, I mean, it's a it was a it, it definitely a huge deal um, uh, last year, particularly when the pandemic was starting and um, people were not as aware of methods to try to decrease the risk like masking and social distancing. And uh, and so numbers were, were quite high. And it was a, uh, as we all know, uh, it was a big surge on the on the medical system. And to try to alleviate that or to try to, uh, you know, find a way to um, make sure that we were treating um patients the best we could um uh, there was you know several systems of allocation kind of put in progress uh various states even uh uh, each individual hospital in certain cases um, uh, convened scarce re resource uh, task forces essentially is what it amounted to and tried to put together documents and try to uh, consider ways in which uh, people uh, would be triaged uh, you know higher up on the list prioritized uh, in a sense to receiving um, some of these needed resources such as uh, ventilators and uh, dialysis and things like that which is uh, really scary to um, to think about out and um, you know uh, touches on the kind of the moral uh, injury uh, that Dr. Chapel kind of uh, spoke um, a bit about as well. And you know you want to go in and treat your patients the best way that you can, but if you're not able to do that because you're forced to follow this algorithm, then that's uh, that's a really scary thing. Well, Dr. Rentmeister, when physicians are making decisions based on things like prognosis. I think we talked before about equity as a consideration here, because a lot of times you'll, you you know that it's already stacked against patients who've been underserved traditionally. Um, what is the ethical guidance about how medicine can respond to the health inequities that we've seen during the pandemic? But the pandemic is widely documented as having exacerbated racial and ethnic inequity. And in public health ethics, it's common to hear folks talk about upstream and downstream roles of healthcare professionals. So downstream, that's where we are right now. Downstream medicine, downstream healthcare has to do with the clinical encounter, the point of care, a patient is ill or injured right now and needs healthcare right now. Um, and upstream is where prevention-based strategies should have been employed to prevent crises that are created downstream. So upstream medicine has to do with partnering with communities to mitigate the material conditions of poverty and discrimination and opportunity inequity. So good upstream healthcare is really guided by two main ethical values. And those are organizational accountability and prioritization of the needs of the most vulnerable people in the communities. So you'll see an example is a federal recommendations about how to distribute and administer the COVID-19 investigational vaccines, for example. Um, these, these recommendations endorse these two values overall and how successful we as citizens will be at expressing those values uh, in practice will certainly become evident over the next few months. Dr. Rentmister, the AMA uh, continues to do a lot of work, obviously, in ethics. Can you talk about some of the resources that we have for physicians and where they can find them? Certainly. In addition to the AMA Code of Medical Ethics, there are current articles, multimedia, and continuing education content in the AMA Journal of Ethics. And that is all free to everyone in the world at journalofethics.org. So our current uh, theme issue investigates uh, racial and ethnic health inequity in the United States. So we encourage you to tap that resource and um, find some things that are helpful there. Excellent. Well, you'll find that, of course, uh, at uh, thejournalofethics.org. And you can also find more uh, resources on COVID-19 at the AMA site. I want to thank Dr. Rentmeester, Dr. Chapel, and Dr. Nelson for being here today and sharing their perspectives. Uh, we'll be back soon with another COVID-19 update. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.